Autonomous emergency braking has been proven to save lives. And as the government moves to mandate it on every vehicle, you have to start to wonder, is there a way to make it safer? As we move to electric vehicles, companies are looking for new ways to not only make their vehicles safer, but make them safer in all conditions. The folks at Teledyne FLIR, who do thermal cameras, have a potential solution which they're referring to as sensor fusion. It's combining the thermal camera, a visible light camera, and radar combined with artificial intelligence to be able to identify more obstacles, more people, and more conditions, and ultimately save lives, making you and your future electric car safer. Let's go for a ride in this Teledyne FLIR sensor fusion equipped Lexus and see how it works. We're officially underway um, in the Teledyne FLIR autonomous LiDAR test vehicle. There's an official name. Ben will show you on a lower third or something, I'm sure, because Ben's smart like that. But um, basically, we're going to try to see some real world examples of where visible camera, visible light cameras maybe fall a little short and why something like thermal can help improve that visibility, make autonomous emergency braking systems safer, and how those could be used in conjunction with potentially other systems like LiDAR to make a more comprehensive suite of driver assist functions. So um, we're in downtown LA uh, right now, looking at the screen, we have the thermal view up, which shows you, even though it's daylight, you can still get a lot of benefit from the camera because like, I mean, it's still high contrast. Like you can, yeah. there's- it's, So there's machine learning. We can tell that that's a vehicle in front of us. We can tell there's buses on the right, buses on uh, in front of that. And at pedestrians, we can tell them with the thermal and then we can switch over to the visible. It really helps to see people uh, visualize what a what a visible camera sees and what a thermal camera sees right right, right when they're driving around. So and then switching back and forth. So one example I kind of hope that we can show is sun glare in in your face in your eyes, um, in the camera's eyes, to where it makes it difficult to see. We recorded some stuff a little bit earlier where you couldn't see these pedestrians walking down the sidewalk. Flip to the thermal camera and they're there as bright as day, basically. I know what we're looking at, but explain to me the technology that you're using, the stack, the, the control, how everything is kind of working together and why you want to do that. Right. So we're a big advocate of, of sensor fusion and bringing in your camera system with a visible and a, a thermal. We make both visible and thermal cameras uh, at Teledyne FLIR, but what we're advocating for is the sensor fusion of the two. And that this demo really shows that we're here we have half and half. We get the color from the visual, yet the thermal is on there too. I'll, I'll move to full thermal. During the day, it works just fine. Sure, yeah. Because uh, people are hot, things are hot. There's a lot of contrast out there. There's a, a, a identifying a, a car going in front of us. And then I can switch to, to the visible camera uh, and, and see what a visible camera sees. And in certain situations like this, that person was wearing all black and he's, he was in a shadow. Right. That can be difficult for a, a visible camera during the day. Right. And but you throw on the thermal camera and it can really help complement uh, for, for difficult situations like that during the day. Th yeah. This is a classic example. We're, we're just now turned into the sun yeah. and we're going to be driving down this road. There's a lot of pedestrians and cars. Here we are with full, full visible. Now we're showing the thermal only and we'll move, move over to the visible. And of course, you've got the glare from the sun. Right. And so that's why if, if the visible camera and the thermal camera are mounted in a very similar location, basically at the, at the same location, at the similar field of view, then they can really complement each other. Rather than uh, existing systems in the field right now that use thermal, they all are just thermal. Right. And so I really would like to advocate, put the two cameras together. Sure. And, and have them um, complement each other. Well, in this section right here, like I couldn't see the convention center at all. I definitely couldn't see people along the street. But then you make that switch and that glare is gone. It's just gone, which is incredible. I um, mean, this is definitely, I mean, to me, this is a real world example of in the, in the daytime, in what you would consider light that's easy to see, really how much you can't see. Yeah, I, I kind of equate it to is if, if you had the opportunity to have visible and thermal, why wouldn't you? Right. It, the, it's just a safer system than one or the other. So the thermal is going to help you in the day as a, as a redundant sensor 
when that's challenged for the visible camera, but it's gonna help you in, in rain and fog and nighttime and glare and tunnels, um, people wearing black, or white on white. Those are the types of situations when the visible really comes in to help, or the thermal really comes in to help and, and, uh, and, and, and kind of sensor fuse with, with the visible camera. So the vehicle we're in right now, um, it's a Lexus RX Hybrid, and both the visible camera and the thermal camera are mounted um, above the windshield, uh, right about sort of where the, the rear view mirror would be if you were inside the car, but straight up from that point. Um, and Chris, you've mentioned that you have to sort of, ideally you want the two cameras as close as possible, so they're seeing the same field of view, have the same sort of overall visibility as, as each one. Right, and, and so there is a, a complication for thermal in that where do you put the thermal camera okay, in yep. relation to the visible camera. Thermal sees long wave infrared radiation, so 8 to 14 micron of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. Glass windows like this block that heat. Sure. So just slapping a thermal camera behind the windshield doesn't work. Doesn't work. So you need to do something else. You either need to put it in a um, on the roof or on a on a like a shark fin, or in a in a, um, uh, a feature of the car on the roof, maybe the roof rail, or you could put it behind the windshield. But now you need to have a special windshield with an IR transmissive material embedded into the glass material. Okay. Which is really kind of the holy grail of sensor fusion with visible and thermal if if they can get windshields that that put a thermal and a visible right next to each other in the windshield with the wimple the, the with wipers, the wipers and, stuff, and yes. the water that is that is the holy grail that would be the for, perfect. for sensor fusion on a vehicle with those two cameras um we were mentioning briefly that compared to something let's say like lidar a thermal camera is significantly less expensive um if e, e, Without quoting a specific price, because I know it's going to vary per OEM and and installation applications or whatever, but compared to LiDAR, these, the thermal imaging is a less expensive sensor. It's just, it just is. Um, as we get closer to AEB requirements, we, we chatted about it earlier that the, um, with the new infrastructure bill and stuff like that, that you know FMVSS get modified for things, and basically AEB is going to become required, and it's Correct. going to be become tested by NHTSA, it's going to be tested by IHS, whatever it is. Um, uh, people watching this might be like, oh, this is going to make my car significantly more expensive. Um, what's sort of the goal in terms of, do you think that we passed on to the consumer, are we looking at an extra hundred dollars for a car, are we looking at a thousand dollars for a car? I'll give you a, a general estimate of what we're talking about with OEMs, many OEMs right now, and this is just, a, a, it, it will be much less than five hundred dollars on OEM vehicles for AEB. So that gives you kind of a framework to understand, okay, much less than five hundred versus what does LiDAR cost? Right. Today, to now, right now. Um, you were also mentioning too that um, a thermal camera has higher resolution than a LiDAR sensor. Right, so I, I kind of characterize the sensors that are out there as your perception sensors, which is your visual camera or your thermal camera, and they have many hundreds of thousands of pixels on target, or, or, or uh, resolution, pixel resolution. So some of these visible cameras are, are eight megapixels, for example. Thermal cameras are uh, VGA resolution, so 640 by 512. That is way more pixels on target than any LiDAR system is going to have that's affordable. So if you use a visible camera and a thermal camera together as your perception system, they both working in concert, then you can choose, well, do I want a radar that gives me that added uh, security of depth, how far away, maybe how, how fast that target is going, sensor fuse that, radar or LiDAR. This car, we chose thermal, visual, and radar sensor fuse together for AEB. Okay. So we think that is the next step in AEB. Uh, last year, you guys took a vehicle and some other cars to the American Center for Mobility and did basically testing with a sensor fusion vehicle compared to other popular vehicles out of the market, Tesla Model 3, a couple other, uh, a Volvo, I believe, um, some cars that you would consider very yeah. safe. A Volvo, I mean, like everybody thinks Volvo is very safe and they did decent in that performance, but um, it was impressive to see how many failed when it got dark. 
Right, and, and mainly that's the purpose of this car, was to show the world that there is technology to create a safe automatic braking system that's affordable right Right now. there is It, it is available. And this car is one of them. Right. And uh, we have a couple more of these cars. But it's basically radar, thermal, and visual with AI. And that's all sensor fused. The car knows where it's going. The camera systems both together identify what they're looking at and say, hey, this is a car or this is a pedestrian that's coming uh, across traffic. And the radar says, hey, it's this, it's this far away. I'm on a trajectory path, slam on the brakes. And in the past, the cars that have done that, like, Tesla you mentioned mm -hmm. or a, a Toyota Safety Sense 2.0 is another one that we tested. We tested the Super Eyesight, which is one of the best systems out there currently. Right. Um, that's, a, that's a stereo system. Correct. Uh, we tested all those and this car did, uh, in our testing, did better than all of them right. in the American Center for Mobility Testing. And so that then led us to borrow this car to IHS, mm -hmm. Institute of Highway Safety. Yep. And we knew that they were testing AEB systems, this is this year, and uncovering that, oh my gosh, these systems that are out there tonight, today, they don't work well in challenging lighting conditions. And so we said, here, go test our vehicle. IIHS cares a lot about this because they're funded by the Insurance Institute. So it, when they're helping figure out insurance rates, obviously they're looking at actuarial ta tables and saying, what's the likelihood of death? You know, they, they're dealing in that. And so they wanna know, what systems are better and what should be into cars because that's going to, again, reduce their risk because people aren't going to die. And they want to make sure the get... systems work before they start in, 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 in changing regulations and testing protocols that, that really encourage new technology to come up and, and be used. But one thing we didn't talk about was animal detection. Yeah, and I wanted to actually hit on that too because you brought up this great thing is like, uh, Volvo, for example, with their autonomous emergency braking, have large animal detection. They, they brag about, you know, they can do that. They can pick up moose, uh, stuff that you would possibly run into in Sweden. Um, it would be beneficial to know if what you're about to hit is alive or dead, or if the system is thinking, well, maybe this is a deer, but then, oh, it's not producing heat, so it can't be a deer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the thermal camera detects heat, and, right. and that's... Uh, all living objects out there sure. <laughs> that, uh, emanate heat. And that's the, the beauty of a thermal camera. It, it's a completely passive system. We don't need to shine lights on these deer. Right. They could be sitting off on the side in, in some bush and at night and maybe in rain. A, a very challenging situation for any other sensor. Sure. Where the thermal camera is it, that's a deer. That's a, that's a and deer. this car actually has been as a neural network that was trained to detect animals. And so, you know, in the U.S., there's almost two million deer hit each year. Oh yeah, that's outrageous. When, and, and when do they get hit during the day? Do no, they, no. Right. How? Again, without specific timelines, because there's been no official announcements from a manufacturer on supporting brands or whatever. But I would imagine OEMs are interested in this. When do you? I mean, are we like five years out from having cars equipped with this sooner? Would you think? That's, that's a very good question. And if you know much about automotive and how you introduce new technology, you, then you realize that it's not <laughs> like you snap your finger. No, it takes a bit. It takes a bit. And so today, if an OEM says, I want a thermal camera for automatic emergency braking, right. it is probably a 2024, 2025 okay. type situation, That's best case. Yep. And there's a lot of um, uh, design requirements on that thermal camera uh, to be put into an automatic emergency braking situation as far as a uh, functionally safe uh, device and, and reliable. Uh, so uh, that's also one criteria that thermal camera needs to hit. Sure. Tone Clear is absolutely doing that. Um, and and then you have vehicle integration. Where do you put the thermal camera? Right. That That is probably... Uh, Probably one of that and cost has probably been the two things that are, are the most uh, hard to overcome. Where do you put the thermal camera on the vehicle? Of the million cam cars out there that have thermal cameras, they are all in the grill. Right. They're all in the grill, and there's, they're not anywhere co-located with the visual camera. Right. And so I think that's a mistake. I think that the thermal camera needs to come back up high vantage point sure. right next to that visible camera so they work in concert. Yeah, and it makes sense where they put it because they're trying to obviously... It's a styling thing. Yeah, it's a styling thing. And designers are, well, designers. 
Um, it's a styling thing, and the and the marketing people within uh, the styling people within an OEM they have a lot of power. And if the regulations aren't in place to require this right. this type of sensing modality, then it's very easy to get knocked off the car. I, I experience it quite often where we're trying to fight with OEMs about where can we put this this camera? They want to put it in the grill. No, no, no. Get it up higher. It needs to be up higher. For those people watching um, on the website at EV Pulse, there's a big story about the AAA testing and the ACM testing and just how how the other cars did without this stuff. And it really, guys, it really becomes almost a no-brainer when you can pull up to an intersection, not see anybody because there's too much glare from the sun, and then immediately just have crystal clear vision. And this stuff's this stuff's important. Um, and the beauty of sort of the system is price-wise, it's not stupid crazy. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for letting us ride in your car. And um, yeah, this is cool stuff. I can't wait to I can't wait to see it in a car. While some automakers will try to convince you that visible light cameras are the only way to go for autonomy and safety, we think after riding in this thermal camera equipped vehicle that combining all of the sensors is better than cutting the sensors out. We'd like to thank Chris again for giving us a ride and showing us how this all works. For more information about the AAA article that we referenced in the video, you can check that out on evpulse.com. And for more coverage from the LA Auto Show, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.